uh, across the evangelical and Protestant world that still recognizes that blessing of God. Uh, it's the Sunday closest to October 31st. I read a great article, it was yesterday or day before, from a pastor father on this matter. And he said, uh, he said, enjoy Halloween, celebrate the Reformation. It's good advice, I think. We will be, uh, God willing, handing out 250 full-size Hershey bars. And in every one of them will be this gospel tract. Something sweet for you, reminding people or informing them and introducing them to the idea that, that while uh, on October 31st we have an unusual infatuation for sweets, there is something sweeter. And that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the light of Reformation Day, uh, Reformation Sunday, I want us to think about a couple of verses from Jude. We read the entire book. I don't know if you know that. We read the entire book of Jude. It's, it's only one chapter. We'll be looking at this, by the way, on Sunday evenings in our Seeing Jesus in All of Scripture. We're coming up on that in the, in the coming weeks. We're in First Peter tonight. Uh, but in Jude, one verse. But it's a verse worth standing for. Let's stand together. And you follow along as I read from this letter. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We're thinking today about contending for a once for all delivered faith in a society on the downgrade. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Thank you, you may be seated. Charles Spurgeon, arguably the greatest uh, preacher of modern time, called the Prince of Preachers, certainly the greatest preacher of the, uh, of the 19th century, uh, had a ministry that was incredible. If you've read about him from the time he was 16 years old, when he began to preach, uh, he never preached in a place that held all of the people who wanted to hear him. And yet, toward the end of his ministry, and he was only in his 50s when he died, his wife Susie a great new biography that's out about her. I would you want more, more about it. Let, talk to me. I'll let you know. His wife Susie said that, that the downgrade controversy killed him. Broke his heart. He couldn't imagine the day would come in England in the 1880s when the Baptist Union made up of evangelicals, heirs of, of missionary movements and enterprises, that they would come to reject the opportunity to adopt a confession of faith because they didn't want to offend the liberals in their midst. Spurgeon challenged the whole matter, was ultimately censured for being antagonistic, for being divisive, and a vote for censure was called on the floor of the Baptist Union, and all but seven people voted to censure Charles Spurgeon. His health had never been good, and this exercise sent him once again to France, to the south of France where he would go to recover from gout and depression. In John MacArthur's book, Ashamed of the Gospel, which I commend to you as well, 
He has a section on the downgrade, downgrade controversy. I'm quoting Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, by, by some means or other, first the ministers, then the churches got on the downgrade. And in some cases, the descent was rapid and in all, very disastrous. In proportion as their ministers seceded from old Puritan godliness of life and the old Calvinistic form of doctrine, they commonly became less earnest and less simple in their preaching, more speculative and less spiritual in the matter of their discourses, and dwelt more on the moral teachings of the New Testament than on the great central truths of Revelation, the Bible, Revelation. Natural theology frequently took the place which the great truths of the gospel ought to have held, and the sermons became more and more Christless. Corresponding results in the character and life, first of the preachers and then of the people, were only too plainly apparent. In March 1887, Spurgeon published the first of two articles in his magazine, The Sword and Trowel, on the downgrade. He published them by a friend, Robert Schindler, who, who stood with him on the matter, and they were published anonymously. Schindler wrote that tracing the state of evangelicalism from the Puritan age to his own time had been followed with a generation or two by a drift away from sound doctrine, ultimately leading to wholesale apostasy. Spurgeon was vindicated. Spurgeon said, we're on a downgrade at rapid pace. The idea of a downgrade was this drifting from truth on a downhill slope, rejecting the full authority and unique, the exclusive uh, revelation of God in Holy Scripture. We've not gotten any better uh, in the United States. Every day, you read of someone, someone you might have read, whose books you read, turning away from the unique, exclusive inerrancy, infallibility, and certainly because of that, the rejection of the sufficiency of Scripture. It happens among our friends. And the little letter of Jude is critical to our understanding of this if we're going to think like Reformation Christians, heirs of the Protestant Reformation. We're not going to re-preach the things I preached last year. I took uh, six weeks, as I recall, to go through on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. I would just commend those sermons to you. They're available on our, our YouTube channel if you want to get a thorough digesting of the truths and issues of the Reformation. But in, in Jude, we see these two ideas that I want to try to develop today. First, there is this common salvation that Christ's followers share. There's not a whole lot, a whole bunch of different salvations. There's a common salvation that we might want to say genuine Christ followers share. And we shouldn't be interested in any other thing called salvation. Second, there's the necessity of contending for the faith against false friends of the gospel. Look, our culture's in, in a bad way. Can't deny that. I'm not a pessimist, though. I mean, I've read, as I told the fellow yesterday, I've read the end of the story, and we win. I mean, it's going to turn out for God's glory and for the good of all who follow him to the end. But the culture's in a bad way. When a vice president says that he's never alone uh, in a room with a woman out of respect for her and his wife, he is laughed and mocked to scorn. But when parents say that they're not going to identify the gender of their child, they're going to let their child be gender fluid and, and grow up, and, and, uh, and schools jump on board and say, if you call that person he and that person doesn't want to be called he, or you call that person she and that person doesn't want to be called she, then you will get into trouble. Uh, just recognize them as Z. I mean, we have gone down the rabbit hole, people, and getting out will not be easy. 
but it's not impossible because of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These two things I want us to see. In, in verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary. So there's this, this eagerness, this desire to rejoice in what we hold in common. But there's a necessity that's going to overrule that for the moment. I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was for once for all delivered to the saints. This first idea of this common salvation that Christ's followers share, the first part of verse 3. What is the common salvation? Well, I mean, th theologies have been written on the faith. Whether it's a three-volume theology or a single-volume theology, uh, summaries have been written. Our own confession of faith, the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, which Spurgeon, one of his first orders of business when he became pastor of New, New Park Street, Baptist Church, which would ultimately become the Metropolitan Tabernacle, one of the first orders of business was to adopt that confession as what he called a body of divinity, that is a, a systematic theology in small compass. If you have received your copy from us and placed it on the shelf or misplaced it, shame on you. We have no expectation here that you would delve into and read an entire systematic theology. If you intend to protect yourself and your family from, from thoughts that are now commonplace and accepted as true, which are pernicious and heretical, you ought to keep that confession at hand. I would encourage devotional reading of it. I would encourage family reading of it. This common salvation. Well, in the Reformation, Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, they came out of that because they rejected the prevailing religious thought of the day which had so, so drifted astray from the gospel that the Pope of the time, wanting to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica, sent out his, his minions, one of, the, one of the best of them being Johann Tetzel, to raise money for the treasury of the Vatican. And here's how he was supposed to do it. He was supposed to sell indulgences. You say, well, I'm sure glad we're beyond that. In, at the millennial year 2000, the Pope in residence at the time declared, you ready for this? Plenary indulgences for everyone. We're going to make a fresh start. The year 2000. We're not beyond that. And so Tetzel would go and sell these, 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 these documents where the Pope had already promised forgiveness. And the, one of the funniest stories I've ever read about this was when there were some folks in a stagecoach riding along. They had their belongings on top. They were inside. Some robbers stopped them and robbed them, took all their personal goods, took their belongings. And the, and the, and the driver of the stagecoach, who was responsible for them, said, you're going to burn in hell for this. And one of the robbers pulled out of his chest pocket, oh, no, I have my indulgence. That's what the, what the reformers were re reacting against. What Martin Luther reacted against in his 95 theses that he nailed to the church door at the church in Wittenberg. Contending. When they discovered that the faith once for all delivered to the saints was nowhere to be seen in, in Roman Catholicism. Then they set about to recover it. And coming out of that are these five solas, these Latin expressions. Sola Scriptura. That salvation is found only in the Scriptures. What do you mean? I know a fellow who was saved one day sitting under a tree. He, he came into it. Yes. And how he was saved then, if he was really saved, was the truth of God revealed in the Scriptures came to bear upon his heart. It's the only way you can get saved. That's why it's so critical to get the, get the Bible printed in every language possible and missionaries get to every people group on the planet. Sola Scriptura. It is our chief authority. Anything else we, we marshal? A confession of faith, for example, and say, you need to read this? You, to the extent that it measures up with Scripture, it has, it has meaning. But if it deviates from Scripture, it is meaningless. Not only Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia. I mean, it's the word for, Latin word for grace. The salvation is by grace alone. You don't prepare yourself to be saved. 
God made all the preparation for you when he sent his sinless son to die on the cross, bearing in his body our sin on the tree, enduring and satisfying God's divine wrath and justice by suffering and dying in our place. Salvation is by grace alone. You don't contribute to it. You can't take from it. Also, sola fide, that salvation is by faith alone. While grace is the, is the activity of God to confer salvation, he does this through a conduit called faith. And when you read, read the scriptures, you realize that, that in the new birth, when you're born again, this faith and repentance are given and the, the conduit is opened. And we receive this marvelous work of salvation by faith alone. But faith never stands alone. We talked about that recently. Solus Christus, salvation is in Christ alone. It's, it's not God as you understand him. It's not that we're all trying to get to the same place. That is devilish nonsense. Salvation is God's idea, motivated and moving by his grace, received by faith, only in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in God and all that stuff will get you a ticket to hell. But in Christ, receiving Christ, there's salvation. And finally, soli deo gloria, salvation is to the glory of God alone. It begins in God. Romans, Romans 11 says it's for from him, through him, unto him are all things. To him be glory. You're saved not primarily to rescue you from hell. You're saved not primarily to be sure you get to go to heaven. You're saved to glorify God. You're saved to accomplish the purpose for which he made you. We ask our children on Wednesday nights, and I hope you're asking them in your home, who made you? God made me. Well, what else did God make? God made all things. Well, why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. Well, how do we glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. Why should we glorify God? Because he made me and takes care of me. You breathe in and out with one purpose, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And multitudes breathe this earth's atmosphere, showing God's kindness and his patience, <laughs> who do not use the breath they get to glorify him. That's the Reformation recovered the gospel. But there's second, this necessity of contending for the faith against false friends of the gospel. Not only does he tell it that he found this necessity to write appealing to you to contend. The word contend there is a fascinating word. It's a compound word that when you peel it away, you hear the word agonizomai. Do you hear agony in that? You hear agonize in that? Agonize. Are you spending any energy? Contending, defending, advancing, asserting the faith, rejecting false ideas. There's a pair of boxing gloves on your bulletin cover. We, Linda and I kicked around some pictures. We're in a war, folks. We're in a war. I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, through a survey that the church is getting its brains beat out in this culture. Now I said we win finally, and we do. When the victory finally comes, the church is going to make Rocky look like a pansy. But we shouldn't be getting our brains beat out. Jude said in the first century, I want you to contend, agonize for the faith, a body of truth, objective truth, that was once for all delivered. In other words, it's not being updated. It's not being changed to fit the prevailing culture. First Baptist Church of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, the pulpit of Herschel Hobbs and other great Baptist worthies, called recently a woman pastor to be their senior pastor. Go outside of Baptist life. Gay bishops. Lesbian bishops being ordained and placed in, in pulpits of other denominations. One lesbian bishop with her spouse called recently. 
These are the so-called friends of Christianity. I don't expect the enemies of the gospel to play fair, to fight fair, or to even be reasonable. But Jude says in verse 4, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. You must remember Jezebel from Thyatira in the Re Revelation, the warning that was given. Well, what's happening? Why, why? I'm not a pessimist, I'm not even really an alarmist, but I'm, I, want you to, I want you to be gripped today with a study that's just come out, Ligonier Ministries joined with, with Lifeway Research. Lifeway Research is a wing of our own uh, Lifeway, uh, what we used to call the... Uh, Baptist Sunday School Board, they joined together for a survey on the state of American theology in 2018. This has been done recent, re, previously in 2016, 2014. It's a, it's a good solid sampling. I'm sure our friend Ed Stetzer had his hand in this and Ed has always got his numbers and his context solid. Focused on six key doctrinal areas. Beliefs about God. Let's just go through this real quickly. Can you, do we have a slide? There we go. Almost seven in ten Americans believe God is perfect and two-thirds accept the resurrection of Jesus. Seven in ten, two-thirds, okay. But an increasing majority of Americans deny that Jesus has always existed. And a similar number relegate the Holy Spirit to being a force rather than a personal being. Thank you. Star Wars. A consistent seven in ten Americans believe in one true God in three persons. Almost as many believe God accepts worship from all religions. Let's just look at the numbers real quickly. 69% of Americans agree God is a perfect being and cannot make a mistake. 57% of Americans agree Jesus is the only person who never sinned. 57% of Americans agree Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. That is Heresy. Nearly six in ten. Two thirds of adult Americans agree biblical accounts of the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus are completely accurate. They believe this event actually occurred. 59% of Americans agree the Holy Spirit is a force, but is not a personal being. This means when you're talking to six out of ten people, and you mentioned the Holy Spirit. You better, better hang some biblical definitions on our language, folks. Because I think many times we're guilty of using the same vocabulary, but a very different dictionary. That's why you may think sometimes I'm going to see, kind of going crazy, but the Holy Spirit is a person. One of the three blessed persons of the blessed Trinity. And I've told you before, if I walked up to your newborn baby and I said, isn't it cute? You'd be offended. Well, I promise you, the Godhead is offended. One in five Americans agree the Holy Spirit can tell me to do something which is forbidden in the Bible. 20%. Seven in ten agree that there is one true God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. 66% agree God accepts the worship of all religions including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Now, when I read that, if you just thought, you mean he doesn't? See me after church, please. What about beliefs about goodness and sin? More than three-fourths of Americans doubt the eternal consequences of sin. Three out of four. Two-thirds find most people good by nature. Just over half believe God measures righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ rather than one's worse. Let's break it down. 23% of Americans agree even the smallest sin deserves eternal damnation, which means 77 do not agree with that. Parenthetically, most people can't even give a biblical definition of sin. 66% agree everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Matt and I had a conversation yesterday. Your friend falls into this category. 53, and by the way, he's a, the friend is a student studying for the ministry. 
He's a part of the 66% who believes that most people are good by nature. 53% agree God counts a person as righteous, not because of one's works, but only because of faith in Jesus Christ. You see the schizophrenia here? I mean, it's just, it's, it's all over the map. What about belief about salvation and, and religious texts? Well, let me drop down to the, to the specific numbers. So you may have to jump some slides with me here. 50% agree the Bible is 100% accurate in all that it teaches. By the way, some of these things are rising. These numbers are rising, but they're, they're still appalling. <laughs> It shows you what we're up against in this culture. 47% agree the Bible, like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths but is not literally true. So it's good. Good advice. Not divine revelation. No, certainly not inerrant, infallible, and all sufficient. 57% agree only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their Savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. 51% only the power of God can cause people to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. What about reward and punishment? Again, we'll go down to the, to the percentages. 54% of Americans agree hell is a real place where certain people will be punished forever. That's, that's good, but that means that 46% don't. 62% agree there will be a time when Jesus Christ returns to judge all the people who've ever lived. 34% agree God will always reward true faith. Look at this. 34% believe, you want to know the influence of institutions and churches in this area, which is the, which is the buckle of, of charismania? 34% agree God will always reward true faith with material blessings in this life. Boy, the, the martyrs on our, on our list would love to know that. They just won't experience it because it's not true. Beliefs about the church. Again, percentages. 58% of Americans agree worshiping alone or with one's family is a valid replacement for regularly attending church. Almost 6 in 10. We used to laugh when the guy said, well, you know, I can, I can worship God just as well sitting out on the lake on my, in my fishing boat. It's like, you know, all of a sudden. Our generations had a lot of kids. You think there's no, no repercussions for not faithfully placing your children under the preaching of the gospel on the Lord's Day on Sunday, the first day of the week? See, the reality is if it's not important to you, you're foolish to think it's going to be important to them. And you're raising functional pagans. 37% agree churches must provide entertaining worship services if they want to be effective. What one fellow called, you've got to have more spit drink them. 25% agree Christians should be silent on issues on politics. Oh, you're a Christian? Be quiet. You're not needed in the public arena. Do you want to see how secular the culture has become? And then finally, what about authority? 60% agree religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. It is not about objective truth. So when you quote scripture to some people, you ever done this? You just quote a scripture to them, and they say, well, that's just your opinion. You didn't interpret it. You just quoted the word to them. That's just your opinion, you see? 60%. 53% agree the Bible has the authority to tell us what it, we must do, <laughs> even if it's personal opinion. 51% agree sex outside of traditional marriage is a sin. So on the bubble here, almost 50%. Don't see that. 52% agree abortion is a sin. Coming up a little bit. 26% of Americans agree that God is unconcerned with my day-to-day -day decisions. So they're theists. I mean, deists. I mean, they're deists. They just, God kind of winds us up and lets us go. Which explains why some people who call themselves Christians live the way they do. 38% agree that gender identity is a matter of choice. Almost 4 out of 10. You think that's a small group of people who are wanting be gender fluid, maybe a small group pursuing that life and lifestyle, but they have support of four out of 10 people in this country. 44% agree that the Bible's condemnation of homosexual behavior does not apply today. Folks, that's the state of theology in America today. That's why we're gonna harp on Reformation 
Never to drift from. Don't forget. So you cannot articulate and defend what you do not personally know and have firm convictions about. We do have a firm foundation in Jesus Christ, but if you're not investing yourself in every opportunity, if you're not, if you're not engaged in a Bible study group, we offer one every Sunday morning at 930. If you're not engaged in under the preaching of the gospel, God's ordained means. If you're not seizing opportunities, oh, how I love Jesus. You want to see Jesus in all seizing those opportunities. You see, you're going, to be, you're going to be culpable to be blown around by every wind coming down the pike. And we are hearing some things today from people that I once called my friends that make me want to throw up. And you're going to hear them too. And they're going to sound good and pleasant because that's the way the enemy of our souls operates. He never comes to you with an outright lie. He just comes to you with a subtle, is that really what that means? Is that really what God intends? Is that really pertinent today? Yea, hath God said. We need to be continually reforming. And by that, I don't mean updating. That's the way the, that's the, way the church reformed and always reforming has been used by liberals. No, no, no. I'm talking about the church reformed coming to stand on reformation principles because it's a stand on the word of God and always coming back to, always examining this thinking I'm having. Does, does, is it anchored in the scripture in objective truth? Or have I suddenly let my personal opinion become objective truth? We've always got to be reforming. We've always got to be exhorting one another. We can't do that apart from one another. We give you several times a week to gather and and hope that you'll do that during the week as well. We can't make you. But we plead with you. Protect yourself. When you pray, deliver us from the evil one, God gives means to do that. That that request is not a rabbit's foot you rub to make it so. It is appealing to God to give you the wherewithal to exercise the means that that will be so, that you will be delivered from the evil one, from the thoughts of the evil one, from the ways of the evil one. Even those who are dressed up, as Jude said, they have come, they've crept in unawares. Well, follow anybody who doesn't seem to love what Jesus loved. Jesus loved sinners. Jesus loved the church. Follow Christ. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. This is Reformation Sunday. Wednesday will be Reformation Day. You want to enjoy some candy? You want to pass out some gospel tracts? To, you know, I thought, Karen told me this years ago. We couldn't get 250 people in our neighborhood to take a gospel tract if we went door to door. In fact, we'd probably be turned into the neighborhood, uh, whatever they are, the, the, the committee, the inquisition, I don't know. And that we're soliciting, we're soliciting door to door, and that's forbidden in our covenant in our neighborhood. But you know what happens October 31st? Even if it's raining, people will come to my door and take whatever I put in their hands. So, I told somebody the other day, you know, we've worked for years to be that house. We hear it every year. Oh, oh, oh that's, the, that's the house that has the big uh, Hershey bars. Yes, we do. 60 cents a piece or less. And inside every one of those is the story of good news, the sweetest story we know about a Savior who loves sinners, who will give you sweetness long after the belly ache. That candy is gone. Engage in reformation in your life. Feed upon the Word of God. Seek the face of God in prayer. People are confused about the Bible's teaching. Not only Americans as a whole, we didn't dig down and look at where evangelicals fall on this, but evangelicals as well. Something very wrong when a majority of Americans can give the correct answers to basic Bible questions and at the same time say that their beliefs are purely a matter of personal opinion. We live in a day when people need to be reminded you're entitled to your own opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts. I exhort you. 
Christians who are heirs of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century who have a Bible chiefly because the Reformers said we need to put the Bible in everybody's hand. And when, when Luther said he was going to do that, the Catholic leader said, before you know it, everyone will be reading this book for themselves. They feared that notion. And you and I have a Bible today, have access to Bibles because of the Reformation. Make much of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, ascended, returning. Make it all about Christ. He alone can say, did you notice in our text we read from Jude that it said Jesus condemned them in the wilderness? It's fascinating. Make much of Christ. Purpose to live for Christ until you die. Purpose to change the little part of earth God's placed you, planted you. Purpose to bring light into a culture that's getting darker every day. Darker and darker with a hastening pace. But don't be discouraged. We know him who is the light of the world. Who said... My light has never been overcome by darkness. And who told us, be the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they will see the way you live quantitatively, qualitatively different from anyone else in the culture. And they will be brought, they'll be constrained to glorify your God. Soli Deo Gloria. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and grateful that as we look back through history, we see the giants, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli, Melanchthon, Spurgeon, on and on we could go, who stood. God, find us faithful, earnestly contending. May we expend energy intentionally to advance the cause of God in truth, to, to share the gospel by whatever means, to live a life transformed by the gospel, recognizing that if we're heirs of the Reformation, then we're called upon to continue to reserve, preserve, restore, reshape, renew our lives, our homes, our church. And as you come, bring power by your spirit, our culture. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand